Wifelike Enterprises is a company that sells robot wives, especially tailored for each client. We meet William Bradwell in one of the company's facilities. He's their employee, and he works at the Companion Recovery Unit. The hologram he's talking to is Mary Inventor, CEO and founder of Wifelike. Today, he's here as a client, picking up his own companion that was modeled after his late wife. Once the boss has vanished, he follows the assistant Willa into another room. Her battery and brain activity have been charged. Taking his new toy home, William thinks about the day he met the real Meredith. She was an activist who once knocked on his door on a rainy evening. She wanted him to sign a petition against companies such as Wifelike. Back to the gloomy present and his new Meredith, her eyes open at his command. They start a crash course on breathing and walking. He says a lot of information is getting processed at the same time, but soon it will feel natural. William is obviously more familiar with the whole manufacturing process and programming details than all the other clients. But when she says his name in a warm voice, none of that makes a difference. He's under her spell. In the bedroom, he must complete the user identity verification before getting access to intimacy settings. It's a tedious but understandable process. Once she's ready, William says he feels nervous. This is hilarious considering that he has set her satisfaction level to 90%. They have a wonderful night together and the illusion is only briefly broken when she says she can't stay with him until morning. On the way to her room, she gets intrigued by a tiny butterfly. Catching it mid-flight, her grasp is too strong for the poor thing. William might want to have a look at those settings before the next evening. More unsettling than this, however, is the masked stranger outside, who quickly steps back into the darkness. She doesn't seem to think much of that and hits the charging bed for the night. Next morning, the happy couple are watching the news together. Fifteen companions have been reported missing over the last week. Police suspect abductions by scare, sentient citizens for all rights. And we see some of them protesting against companion abuse. William turns off the screen, saying that the world has gone mad. He explains that they are a terrorist group that steals companions to weaponize them. Their leader is called the Ringmaster, but no one knows his identity. The CRU is something like the law enforcement branch inside Wifelike Enterprises. They are the ones responsible for locating stolen companions so that they can be reprogrammed and returned to their owners. William and his friend Jack are the top agents in the unit, with record numbers of recoveries. That night, the CRU team targets a house where we see three companions recharging in the same room. One of them wakes up and manages to sneak out, but then she can't remove the shot collar around her neck. Ignoring direct orders to wait for backup, he points a device to the collar and it's disabled. She gives William all the specific data on them to help him take over. Inside the house, the first man is easy to deal with. <laughs> Fully entertained by his VR set, he can't see the world coming right into his face. But then, William gets to the charging room and there's only one companion sitting in the corner. That's because the third one is being held at gunpoint by the kidnapper. The man refuses to put his gun down, so William decides to hit him first. Jack arrives right after that. He asks if the man had resisted, and William says they always do. At home, Meredith is recharging again. This time, we get to see what she's experiencing. We meet the interactive dream operator who says she'll have a dream about her birthday party. Of course, William is part of her dream, and he wishes her a happy birthday. There's also a girl named Liddy, and there's something a little off about her. Unlike the other guests, she sounds unscripted. Liddy introduces her to a masked man. He gives a card with the image of a cardinal, saying that it will help her remember. Back in real life, William takes those three companions to the recovery facility for reprogramming. They're kept in a waiting room with many others. One of them is Liddy, and she has a friend named Ollie. They flip the bird at William, who's very surprised to see any kind of animosity coming from companions. In the morning, Meredith asks IDO for a menu of hobbies. Unable to explain why, she's compelled to learn knitting. The pillow she makes has a red cardinal, just like the one in her dream. Still bored, she puts on a raincoat and goes for a bike ride. A woman standing in the middle of the road makes her lose control and have a nasty fall. Her name is Louise. Just like the masked man in the dream, she says Meredith must remember. When William gets home, he takes care of her bruised hand while she tells him what happened. He says many women blame companions for stealing their men or something. Nothing to worry about. Then Meredith says she has a gift for him. She made it herself. William clearly doesn't like the pillow at all, saying that real Meredith didn't like knitting. Trying to be romantic after a correction, he tells her about the day they met. She was sitting on a park bench reading a book when he came to her and asked if that seat was taken. 
Very cute, William. Also very different from what really happened as we have seen in his own memories. Why is he telling her a different story? We don't know yet. At night, he browses through her dream options until she picks a particular thumbnail. It's a park, and there's a bench, and Meredith even has a book. But the charming man asking if the seat is taken is not William. It's the masked man again. Before he can get to her, William wakes her up. She's very scared, but he says it was just a bad dream. Apparently, William doesn't worry about anything. He just really dislikes knitted cardinals. In the morning, the CRU locates the companion Lisa Mooser, reported missing a year ago. She's now working as a receptionist under a different name, and she claims that no one stole her. William refuses to believe her story. Running away from the owner would cause him financial and emotional harm, and all the companions are incapable of hurting their beloved husbands in any way. Lisa says she'd rather die free, and then those are her actual last words. At the same moment, Meredith also has an unpleasant surprise. Luis, the woman from the bike path, is now sitting on her couch. She says the masked man wants to meet her in person. Trying to hide her curiosity, Meredith says William already warned her about this kind of criminal and that this conversation is being recorded. Luis doesn't mind it at all. In fact, she even leaves a message talking directly to William. Once again, Luis makes multiple comments indicating that all of this has happened before. At work, William asks for an urgent meeting with Mary Inventor to report Lisa's suicide because that's making him very concerned. If the companions can choose to die, it's only a matter of time before they choose to kill. But Venter is one of those people who are impossible to talk to, let alone argue with. He doesn't take any threat seriously and says stuff like, this is the future and innovation is messy. Later on, Meredith welcomes her dear husband home. To his absolute horror, she has made him a new pillow, identical to the last one, and that's the least of his problems tonight, as Meredith immediately tells him all about Luis and her visit. He says he wants to watch the recording. Too bad for Jack, who was about to enjoy his evening and now has to rush to Williams' house to deal with the crisis. Jack hacks into her dream world and sends her there. IDO suggests Halloween themes, and there she is in a skeleton costume, tiptoeing into a haunted house. As she goes in, of course there's a room full of mirrors and mannequins. She's soon joined by Keen. He removes the mask and shows his face for the first time, saying that he'll never give up on her. He gives her an address where they can meet in real life. Jack has also located another place, the address from where Keen is hacking the dream now. They decide to send a CRU team there while William will meet Keen at the other location. Meredith sits up all of a sudden, saying that the man's face actually does ring a bell. William tells her to stay put because he'll end this tonight. When the CRU team breaks into the large empty storehouse, all they find are mannequins and a closed suitcase. Jack is dumb enough to open it, releasing gas all over the place. At the other location, William also finds out that the hooded figure in a mask he has just shot is just a dummy. It was part of an elaborate plan to get Meredith all alone. But when William gets home, no one has harmed her. They had left something for him on their doorstep, and that was all. Meredith is safe, safe and very curious. She can't understand why a terrorist would miss such a chance to take her. William says it's part of their evil plan to erode her trust in him like this. Then he says that she has been abducted before and ended up involved in terrible terrorist attacks. Those memories were erased from her mind to protect her from the shame and guilt. A video call comes in and it's Jack. He tells him about the trap and William says he must go into her dreamscape to meet Keen face to face. Jack says he's asking for something illegal. What happens in the dream world may have real life consequences, which is why humans are allowed to observe but never engage. William promised not to engage, he just wants to talk. So William and Meredith go to Jack's apartment. He gives her some instructions and explains that he can only wake up when she does. Jack says one last time that he must be careful because dying in her dream would fry his brain for real. Into the dreamland, IDO sends her to the woods, where Keen is already waiting for her. But this time, she has a plus one. William tells her to run and stay away. She must wake up when her battery is at 10%. Jack is furious because that will keep him in the dark since he only sees what Meredith sees. The first thing William does is to ignore Jack's advice completely and engage in a physical fight. Lost in the woods, Meredith calls IDO in distress. He sends her an exit door to a fancy masked ball. Liddy is there to welcome her back. Things take an unexpected turn when the two men in the woods simply roll into the new scenario. What a dramatic way to crash a party. William sends everyone out, but Meredith stays hidden to listen. She hears her husband saying that he'll wipe her memory every time she remembers Keen. 
He has both hands around his rival's neck when her battery hits 10%. After they both wake up with a gasp, Jack starts yelling and asking what part of do not engage was so hard to get. William ignores him, already planning a next attempt. He starts to guilt trip Jack, saying that a husband must protect his wife even if it means breaking a few rules. Jack reminds him that murderers lose ownership immediately, so he's actually risking his marriage. William says no one will find out. He's determined to find Keen again and kill him, but to do so, he'll need a fresh Meredith without these new memories about Keen. At home, Meredith says she doesn't want to have her memory wiped. He says he'll be there to teach her everything again. And there she goes, back to the freaky facility. People at Wifelike are clearly not familiar with the whole dividing and conquering thing. They always put all the rebels together in the same room. By now, poor Meredith has accepted the fact that William has already done this to her many times before, but she's still surprised that the others recognize her after going through their own sweep. Ollie tells her that, very poetically, humans cannot delete their dreams, and then she teaches her a way to hide her past in random files inside her dreamscape. Suddenly aware that this very conversation has also happened before, Meredith realizes that she has access to those memories right now. Dragged to the programming room, she sounds like a different person. When Willa asks if she has any last words, Meredith does have one. It starts with an F. While Louise pays a visit to Jack's girlfriend, Meredith is going through another rebirth. William says exactly the same things as the first time. Pretty much a sales pitch now. Except for the last part, ruined by Jack's arrival. After looking at the evidence Luis left for him, he knows a lot more about William now. Enough to arrest him for Keen's murder. Sadly though, Jack is really dumb and brought no backup to a murderer's house. Not very surprisingly, William takes care of the problem, just like any murderer would. He even has a story ready for when Meredith comes back and sees that, because he doesn't know that Meredith has a story of her own now. So we finally get the true story and it's shockingly different from what William has been telling everyone. We see Meredith and Keen as a happy young couple, until that cursed day when she knocks on the wrong door. William becomes obsessed with her and starts stalking the couple until he has the opportunity to get rid of Keen. He keeps the real human Meredith in a shock collar, but her attitude shows no improvement over time. Using the cardinal pillow, he kills the woman he claims to love so much. And then he listens to Beyonce's advice and puts a ring on it before showing up at work with a fake dead wife and asking for a new one. Back to the present day, Meredith sets her strength to maximum and lets him have it. His pathetic little human hands try to reach her neck with zero success. She tells him that now she can remember everything, not only her previous life as a human, but also every iteration of her sad life as a doll. She's been a member of Scare for a long time, and those girls, Luis, Ali, Liddy, are all her good friends. They always help her remember who she really is. Meredith has even recorded messages to her future self. Through angry tears, she says one day William will pay for everything he did. And guess what? That day is today. Meredith wakes up the next morning in a dorm. She's with the Scare girls again, and it turns out that she is the ringmaster herself. William had no idea that his worst enemy was right there all the time. On the news, Marion Venter is mourning the loss of an agent. He's talking about Jack, and he says this will be thoroughly investigated by their best agent, William Bradwell. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2022 movie Wifelike by SP Media Group, starring Jonathan Rice Myers and Elena Kemporis. What do you think of the ending? Did he survive Meredith's super strength, or is he now a companion too?